Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Well, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I am Eki Tepsapornchai. And guys, we have a, a very special guest with us for this episode, Dr. Abner Chow. Um, thank you for joining us. It's really a privilege to have you on. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for all your guys' ministry. Happy to be a part. Well, Dr. Chow, before we get into uh, our topic today, which is going to be talking about the LSB and translation, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with you, um, or they've just seen your name around because you know it's been attached to the LSB, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the various ministries you're involved in, and then we'll kind of segue from that into uh, translation talk. Sure, happy to. Yep, my name is Abner Chow, and I have the honor and the privilege to serve here at the Master's University and Seminary. I'm a professor here. I'm also the John F. MacArthur Endowed Fellow. And I also have the honor of being the president of both institutions. Uh, and so that's a little bit of my life. I got saved at uh, a young age, but the Lord really, through my mother's influence, uh, completely demonstrated the supremacy of his word, especially as I was going through middle school and high school. And from that point forward, I just love the scriptures and I love teaching them and I love to exalt the glory of God. And, and that's what drove me to learn at the college at that time in seminary, and then ultimately to be a part of that wonderful ministry. Amen. Well, I know I was first exposed to you um, in the doctoral program. You came and gave us a lecture and uh, it, it was really fantastic. And it was at that stage uh, after I came home that that my wife really appreciated your personality because I told her of all your Poirot references and oh, she yeah. loves that show. It's hey, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, parallels between what a detective does and good inductivism yeah. uh, that Poirot has or really Agatha Christie behind it and what we do in Bible study. And so, yeah, there I I appreciate I appreciate just some of the humor and also some of the analogies that can help pastors and lay people to know how to study the word of God better. That's awesome. I just threw that in there for my wife because she listens to the podcast and I like to do that every now and then. I'm all for it. Um, I'm all for it. Well, Dr. Chow, so let's talk about the LSB. Um, so what, what was your specific role in the LSB? And then maybe give us just a little bit of backstory. How did the LSB even become a thing? Where, where did that thought begin? Yeah, so I, I had the real joy of being able to translate not only the Old Testament or the New Testament. Oftentimes, translators, uh, they have the opportunity to do a section. Maybe they're going to do Paul's epistles, or they're going to do the Pentateuch, or they're going to do Isaiah. And they just focus on that one specific portion of scripture. But in God's kindness to me, I had the opportunity to be able to translate everything from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, also, I was overseeing the people translating different portions of the scripture as well and filtering through their comments, as well as filtering through the comments of uh, other scholars that were kind of our peer reviewers whether from a scholastic point of view, an academic nerdy point of view, or people just reading it and saying in English, does this really read okay? Can, can, we, can, we, can we say that a little better? And I would go through all of those comments and work with the team on all of those comments. And then ultimately with the team, make decisions and lead in those decisions uh, for what would be the final edits on the Legacy Standard Bible. So I also because uh, you have that responsibility. I also was responsible sometimes for typing in things into the computer. And sometimes what people don't know about translations, I didn't know, is that it's all done in computer code. So it's not mm -hmm. just a Word document that says, that reads just like you would read your Bible. It's 
all with these special XML codes and, and everything wow. has a code. If you want something in red, you have to make it a code italics. You have to make it a code yeah, right, small right. caps. You have to make it a code. So at one time I remember that everything was going to print red because I forgot to finish the codes <laughs> properly and, and everything turned into small caps, you know, and all these kinds of things. So, yeah, I was involved in a lot of that process behind the scenes as well. And it just gave me such a great appreciation, not only for the word of God, which is categorical. What an honor it is to be able to translate the whole Bible and go through it. It just elevates our yeah. conviction about the inspiration and inerrancy of the word of God. But also a great appreciation for translators old like Tyndale who didn't have the resources I have and uh, what a remarkable man and under persecution mm -hmm. but also translators modern because it's a lot of work doing those codes you know you you put your mouse over something in Logos Bible software or accordance or whatever you may be using and it pops up the Greek and Hebrew word yeah. well somebody's got to program that and it's and it's usually one of us so we it is a massive effort to do these things and it's worth all the effort because it's the word of God. Oh, so how, how many people, how many people were involved overall in the translation process? So there was a core team of, of six or seven of us. Uh, there was Dr. MacArthur, as we all know, and myself and Jason Beals, Dr. William Varner. We're all uh, more on the university side, but we also had those in the seminary, including Joe and Mark Zakevich and also Paul Twiss. <clears throat> um, so those would be some of the core team members involved. And we were all translating through the scriptures together, uh, but we're just not all, we're, we, we were the core team, but we weren't the only team. Yeah. Uh, there were people who were peer reviewing us uh, from other seminaries, from other in our seminary, in Grace Community Church, other churches across the world, because we wanted to make sure that the English would reflect not just American English, or as some people would say, American. We wanted it to actually reflect in English, which is spoken right. by, I suppose, the rest of the world. So um, we wanted to make sure all that was happening. So there was a team of those individuals. There are people we wanted to make sure that we were ministering to all kinds of people. So different readers from grandmothers to kids, they were all involved in reading. So the team in total, after you count all those people in was close to, uh, if you want to count a tighter team, it's 50. If you want to count everybody who was involved, it was about 75 people. Okay. And, and you wow. guys, you guys turned this around pretty quick. I, I seem to remember, maybe yeah. it was 2020 at the ShepCon when uh, the, right. the TMS banquet, it was first announced that uh, th this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And and you guys got out the you know the, the New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs, that kind of giveaway with the cowhide uh, skin, That's I right. think within a couple of years. And, and that, right. that was surprising. How, how did you guys manage to squeeze all that in, in such a tight time frame? Oh, that's a that's a great question. So, yeah, no, your memory is really good. 2020 was when they announced, hey, we're going to be engaging on this. And really the week after Shepherd's Conference, that Monday, we started <clears throat> and and we didn't exactly know what we were getting into. And we didn't just just, just during the COVID shutdown, just as COVID shut down, yeah. you guys. And then, and then the shutdown happened. And then and then we said, well, at least we have time now. Uh, so <laughs> that's amazing. Um and we had to finish Psalms, New Testament, and Proverbs by, so that we started in March. We had to finish that by, say, August. Wow. I remember Labor Day weekend uh, being so thankful that that part of Psalms, New Testament, and Proverbs was done and sent to the printer. And that was so that there could be a Psalms, New Testament, and Proverbs printed in time for Shepherd's Conference 2021, actually. Oh, right. And then by 2022 the full Bible was released. But to release that and to have it printed, you have to release the actual typeset and everything far, far in advance. So we were finishing um, the LSB by, I would say, February, March of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that. Yeah, it was right around the end of February 2021 that we had to be done. So it was basically a year, a little over a year, I guess you could say, and we finished. And it was, 
you know, people have a Bible reading plan for how to read your Bible in a year and you read this many times. I just pulled up on translated a Bible in a year. <laughs> yeah, it was to translate the Bible in a year plan. And it was in Lagos and I had check marks. This is what we're going to read today and do today because if we don't, then we're not going to get through this. Wow. Actually how it took place. So tell us now how, how, where did the idea to even do That's this right. come from? Yeah. You know, and I want to encourage your listeners. I think often people see the proliferation of Bible translations and I understand that. And they just wonder, does that mean I can't trust what I'm reading? Why do we need all of these things? And I am totally with people there. I understand those concerns. In fact, the story, at least for me, starts with uh, the following anecdote. Somebody at a nerdy conference, the November before all of these things start to kick off, said, would you be willing to do a Bible translation? And this this person was asking me a lot of questions. Would you be willing? Would you, you know, maybe we could get some donors together and, and fund it. And I just said, no, I don't, I'm not really interested. Like, I'm really happy with what's going on out there. I'm, I'm really content. And and uh, you know what? What am I gonna do? What can I really do? Uh, we're okay. And so I think hopefully that sentiment shows everyone listening. Yeah, you. I get the concern. I, I truly grasp the concern about the proliferation of Bible translations. So you say, well, then why'd you do it? Well, show, to, shows you pride before the fall. I said, no, no, I, I'm, I never, no, that's just completely unnecessary. It'd take me like six years to finish a translation minimum. You know, if that's, if I was working full time, well, little did I know that about a month or a month and a half later, Dr. MacArthur would pull me into his office and said, hey, you know, there are a bunch of different translations coming out, uh, including the NASB 2020 and, yeah. and things from Lockman. And Lockman has really expressed a desire for us to partner together to preserve the old way, to huh. preserve the NASB 95 and even going back to the NASB 77. Would you be interested in that kind of preservation work? And I sat back and I thought, well, this is ironic. I just told somebody else like a month and a half ago, like, uh, no, thank you. And But but this is Pastor John. I, I can't really say no. And I don't really want to say no. And not, not only that, what an amazing privilege. Because I'm not, yeah. from other translations, you're not only starting from scratch. You're, you're starting uh, from a publishing and a recognition standpoint from, from really ground zero here. This is already something well received. This is already something that's well accepted. And the goal, and this is why it's called the Legacy Standard Bible, is to preserve a legacy. It's meant to not change something new or to do something new and different or to head in a different direction. It is to make sure what you already have is going to be kept and kept well for future generations. And that kind of project is different. This is not a proliferation of a Bible translation. This is actually a retention of Bible translations and a specific system of it. This is retention and deepening and further entrenching of that philosophy that says every word inspired, every word translated, therefore every word preached. That is kind of what this legacy standard Bible translation was all about. And the, of course, I had already said, no, I'm not going to do translation. And then now I'm doing it. And I had already said, oh, yeah, it's going to take me at least six years. And so Dr. <laughs> MacArthur says, let's do it in a year. And I was like, sure, why not? I mean, we'll, we'll, <laughs> I've already eaten humble pie. So let's just eat it all the way, you know, and and no, and God's good providence. Um, that's how it kind of went down. It humbled me. But what an amazing opportunity. And one of the major reasons is admittedly pretty selfish, which is I, I just wanted to be in the word of God and no yeah. better way to do it than to wrestle with every single verse as you're translating. Now, what's yeah. fascinating about that, I, I didn't realize Lockman had actually proposed uh, preserving what was there before, but that also seems to show that they recognize there was a direction or, or maybe with the 2020 that that something was 
not what was getting lost or going in a different direction that maybe in house there were some that maybe didn't support that or wanted to keep it um what well, what was your take on that did you have any idea on what their motives were uh i think i think they recognize with any bible translation you you have different philosophies and different implementations yeah. of that philosophy and and they weren't breaking with the tradition that they had they were though moving a little bit to cater to the reader uh, the yeah. the NASB has always been accused of let's put it that way even yeah. though i refute the allegation but it has been accused of being this wooden kind of translation hard for the reader to understand and i think in their desire to kind of deal with that um, accusation, they tried to do things with the 2020 that would um, accommodate that mm. those kinds of um, issues. And they recognized, hey, but do we have to do it that way? No. And so they wanted to have something recognizing a very, very loyal base of people in 77 and 95. And that those two veins were going to potentially become obsolete. Uh, whether or not that actually happens is we'll see what the Lord does, but nevertheless, the potential for it was there. And so they said, let's preserve it. Let's preserve it. And happy to do that. Happy to do it in a very deep way and to take really the Bible back to its roots. Bible translation that is. Yeah. So, so when people, Dr. Chow, oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead Nathan, yeah. Uh, well, when, when people ask me, what's the major difference? Because I've been preaching out of the NASB 95. Um, I was saved at Grace Community Church in 2007, went to TMS and all that. And the the two things that jump out to me immediately was, I know how doulos often gets translated bond servant, and, mm -hmm. and I know that that was going to now get translated slave. And I know in the Old Testament, uh, the word for Yahweh would actually be transliterated as Yahweh rather than mm -hmm. all caps, Lord. But that wasn't really the extent of the changes. At first, I thought they were just going to, you guys were just going to make some minor changes here and there to, to things like those words. But I think it extended beyond that. Could, could you speak to the, the changes that happened and in preserving a tradition, um, why make those changes? Yeah. So let, let's talk about the changes and then why make them and how does yeah. that preserve things? So you're absolutely right. Two of the most noticeable ones would be change, uh, having Duos as slave and having Yahweh as Yahweh um, in the Old Testament, translating the name of God as his name. Um, and on top of that, though, those two changes, though, would be really easy to make. Yeah. I mean, that's just control find and you just start <laughs> right. changing things around and making sure it reads smoothly. If we had a year to do that, we could definitely make the deadline. No problems. But there were two other things, for lack of a better way of categorizing it, that we did on top of those changes. One is we checked everything. I think that's what people may not understand, and that's okay. I just want to clarify that we checked every verse. And, and so this is just yet another pair of eyes, another generation of eyes that says, this is right. This is yeah. good. This should be affirmed. This should be preserved. There are no mistakes here. This is, this is exactly what should be. So that, so sometimes when nothing seems to change, actually that's still our effort of affirming this is exactly it. And, and sometimes just to affirm, and I, I hope our listeners are just so encouraged by this, that sometimes we would think, oh, I bet, I wonder if we could change this and change that and modify this and rearrange that to just get it that much more accurate, to get it that much more precise. And we said, oh, but this would be misleading here. And that would be, that wouldn't work there. And this would be awkward. And yeah, the they actually, we probably just reinvented the wheel because they, that's exactly the best way to say it. And we had so many moments like that. And so this translation is not trying to denigrate other translations or denigrate yeah. what they've already had. It's actually meant to affirm it. It's actually meant to affirm and preserve it. And so there's that checking that took place. But there's another C, which is the issue of consistency consistency and what we wanted to do is to make sure that there was increased consistency with the greek and hebrew text just categorically speaking that grammar was preserved if it's a participle let's make sure it's represented as a 
participle. If there's a conjunction here, let's make sure that there's a conjunction reflected in the English so that what you see in English is a window right back into the Greek and Hebrew, no problems. That, that was a major goal. And within that, a component of consistency was that particularly within passages, particularly with the same author of scripture, we wanted that the same Greek or Hebrew word as much as possible and within nuance would be reflected consistently by the same English word. So that when you say, hey, that word there matches that word there, that's because in Hebrew or Greek, the author the used word. the same word. Yeah. That can often get lost in translation because there's a concern to use variety, to have a variety of style. But sometimes, oftentimes, the way the author would weave his narrative or his epistle together or make wordplay or make a theological point or make connections between different parts of scripture even is by the repetition of key words and key phrases. And so it is very important for us to maintain consistency so that we can make the connections the author was making originally. And that's one of the reasons why we made all the small surgical edits that we did was because we're not trying to deviate from the the system, the mentality, the philosophy of translation that has been found, to be frank, in the KJV, that has been found in the New American Standard 77 and 95. We're not trying to deviate from that. In fact, we're trying to preserve and deepen it. We're mm. trying to build upon what was already there and do it more. We're, we're trying to make the NASB, as the phrase goes, more NASB. That is the goal of the LSB. And just like there is progressive sanctification, and we are, get, we are being refined by the Lord more and more, we are refining a translation, not categorically changing it. A lot of people read it and say, this almost reads like the NASB. Well, what's the difference? Perfect. Job well done for us. Yeah. Because we don't want you to think it's different than that. We just want to make subtle changes that take the NASB and make it more what it always was intended to be to give an even more refined tool to the church. So to strengthen the faithfulness of the translation. That's right. That's right. And and maybe other generations after us, they may build on our shoulders to do the same thing. Well, that's kind of the point. That's That's the beauty of this whole situation is we just want to do things more faithfully. And maybe by God's grace, the church, because they're familiar with how this translation works and the learnings that come from it, then they'll be ready for an even more rigorous and more consistent translation because they know what to look for. And we've and everything has been moving forward in the growth and sanctification of the body in that way. So, Dr. Chow, th this is leads us into a really uh, good place to ask the next two questions they kind of go together at least i'm gonna put them together you've answered them really already a couple different ways and times but for the guy sitting in the pew who's thinking man another translation um wh why should i use the lsb um over my kjv or my nasb 95 or my esv right. and along with that thought generally comes the next one which is well, if I'm thinking about switching translations, how, how do I know I can trust these new translations? Like, should I always be looking to find the next translation? Like, what does that do to our um, uh, our our belief in in the inerrancy and sufficiency of Scripture if things are changing? Kind of kind of speak to those normal questions that folks might have. Absolutely, and I think the right approach and the right analogy is to talk about translation as a tool. It's a tool. And it's a tool that does a specific job. Fundamentally, for the person in the pew saying, man, I just love my KJV. I just love my NASB 95. I just love my ESV. Look, for me, I think, praise God. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I want you to be in the word. Yeah, I yeah. want you to, and this is the pastoral side of me, I, I hope that comes out. I want people to be deep in the scriptures, deep in the word of God and the God of the word. Uh, far be it for me to say you have to use this translation. This is the best one for you or something like that. And I know there's a marketing 
aspect to things, but theologically and fundamentally, I want people to be in the scriptures. I want people to be studying and meditating on the truths of God's word. So for the person who's saying, man, there's just another one out there, I get its overarching purpose and kind of the greater picture, but I'm just one person and I just like my Bible and I've been in it since I was a kid and, and now I'm older. Why would I leave it? I would tell that person, be in the word. Don't you don't need to leave anything. Amen. And, and Amen. just like you have tools, though, just like you have tools, hey, stay in your KJV, stay in your ESV, stay in these things, and add another tool to your toolbox. Yeah. Add 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 an LSB and say, ah, oh, I wonder why it's different here. I, I wonder why this is happening. You know. And Nathan, you 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 know this because well, I teach it in demon class all the time. It's not just authorial intent. It's not just what. It's not just information. It's what, why, so what. The more we're asking, not just what a text says. Amen. We got to do that. We got to be very diligent and affirm it. That's inerrancy for sure. But you can't just stay there. You got to ask why. Why did the author write this down in context? And the context fills it in. Well, when you compare translations, often you're not you're you're actually rethinking oh, did i really catch what this word meant did i really understand what the nuance here was and then on top of that it challenges and says ah huh, i wonder why they're different i wonder if there's something that is being brought out about the author's intent in context that's why it's being translated this way and translations in their comparison as tools in a toolbox can help us ask the questions that we really need to be asking in Bible study, driving us back to learning from our pastors and teachers in the original languages and the like, what God said and what he meant by what he said. And in so doing, man, that just increases Bible study. So it's not dump your translation and go to the upgraded version. No, 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 no. It's another tool in the toolbox. It's another tool in the toolbox. That's what it is. And for those who are actually thinking, maybe you've just gotten saved. Maybe you are a person who wants to change translation for a different reason. Maybe you think, I'm going to study the Bible really for the first time in my life, for real, in depth, persistently. I'm committed to do this. Why should I have the Legacy Standard Bible? How do I know I can trust this? Well, I think you go back to the methodology by which we worked and who we are at convictionally. We are people who believe in the inerrancy and the inspiration, the highest of the scriptures, the highest view that every single word is the word of God. And therefore it should be faithfully represented and reflected in a word for word translation. That's our philosophy. We believe that Every word matters, and every word is part of the author's intent and thereby communicates the truth of God and theology. And so it should be reflected. It doesn't matter if it's wooden. It doesn't matter if it's pedantic to the English and modern readers hearing. This is the word of God. It is important. And those things that we sometimes think are just so pedantic, are so overused, or, oh, we can just kind of smooth it out. We often find, wait a minute, later on, that actually mattered. That was actually yeah. on purpose. You know, that wasn't just awkward in English. That was awkward in Greek and Hebrew when it was originally yeah. written. And those original readers are scratching their head and saying, Paul, couldn't you have said it a different way? Come on, use some smoother words. The false <laughs> teachers are doing that. Like, why can't you do that? Why? 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 Because Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, want to make a point. And we need to reflect that same point. I think the irony of modern Bible translations is that often our Bible translations are much smoother than the original was to the original audience. Mm. We're not even giving them a parallel reading experience. Those original mm. readers are saying, man, <laughs> you guys got them. You guys got the simplify. I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking through this hard too. And, and we want to make sure our people are thinking. And that's the philosophy that drives this translation. It is, that which brings out each particular word as it is in Greek and Hebrew. That's our commitment. That's the commitment to consistency and accuracy that we have and the preservation of it in the past. What I want you to see when you read the LSB is what I see when I read Greek and Hebrew. 
That's mm-hmm. what I want you to see. I want you to have that tool in your hand. That's our commitment. And so if you want to study the Bible with that kind of precision and that kind of depth and with that kind of confidence, then that's why you go for the LSB. It's a it's a specific kind of tool for a specific kind of task. And that's how we crafted it to be. And and what you're describing really points to the difference between translation and interpretation. That's right. It sounds like with the LSB, you're trying to provide the most faithful translation possible without over-interpreting the text because you want the interpretation to be the work of the reader. Yeah, that's such a good point. And if you look at the committee, we're all preachers. We're all yeah. preachers. And so there's always the temptation. Oh, we could say it this way and make yeah. it you know, that much more enthusiastic. But that's the preacher's job. That's the preacher's job. We give him the text to preach. He's the one that preaches. And and here is something that I think I was just even reminded of this on Sunday. A dear brother came up to me in church, ran up to me and said, oh, I have these questions. And I said, I'm happy to answer them. And he said, you know what happens? I noticed that some translations, they, they to try to solve a problem. Mm-hmm. They translated it this way to avoid misconception in one way. And they try to smooth it over and alter the wording. But then when I was speaking to a cult, then the cult pointed out, hey, this is a problem. In other words, by trying to solve one problem, they created another problem. Yeah, yeah. Look, translators, we're not omniscient. We don't, we're not that good. And so our job is just to make sure that what the Greek and Hebrew is articulating and reflecting and has been written is being transferred over, translated into the English. And the issues of interpretation, the issues of theology and such like that, that even though we, of course, have convictions about it, our job is to give that to the preacher so that they can make decisions and convictions based upon the submission to the word of God. I would put it this way. You can never just win a theological argument by altering a translation. That's a cheap way to win. That's the way the cults do it. Mm -hmm. The word of God stands on our theology is not because we could rig a translation to get results. It is because our beliefs are rooted in what God has revealed and said and written. Amen. Well, <laughs> Dr. Chow, are you ready for a lightning round? Uh, sure. We've got a few minutes left here. Um, let me see if I can just get off as many of these questions as possible. And uh, if any of them are, are too involved, we can just set those aside for some other time. Let, let, me, um, let me kind of start with maybe the more technical, and then we'll go from there. Um, so one of Um, our brothers has asked the question about a particular way of translating uh, the tenses from the old into the English. And so where we have the the historical present tense in the Greek that did not come over into the present tense in the English. Can you help us understand why that decision was made? Yeah. So in sum, the Greek text and the Greek uh, writers of the scripture or the writers who wrote in Greek under the inspiration of the spirit, they sometimes use the present tense to intensify what they were saying. It's a climactic way, uh, an immersive way, a vivid way to show the progression of what would happen, particularly in a story, in a narrative. And the way the NASB traditionally designated that was to use asterisks. And the LSB maintained that. And it maintained it for two simple reasons. One is because when we we are trying to preserve what the L, the NASB did, we're not trying to change it unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. And second, we're preserving not only what the NASB did, but we're preserving a careful balance of making sure we don't throw new readers off of, wait, why is the tense changing all over the place? I don't know what's going on. Instead, we use a tool. That's the key. Tools even have tools inside of them. And we have footnotes and we have cross-references and we have italics and we have asterisks in this case that asterisk the word and say, hey, even though, yes, for the sake of smoothness, 
you are reading this and it doesn't jar you at all to see the progression of past tense verbs. But this one, this one's present tense. This one has heightening to it. This one has some special emphasis, a good kick to it, so to speak. We want to make sure that's reflected. And that way, we're balancing, making, and ensuring that things are readable and understandable and not a stumbling block or unnecessarily confusing without explanation to people. But yet, what is in the Greek and Hebrew is still reflected. And we have to use all those tools. And that's why we did it. Awesome. Okay, next question. Um, so this one is about a particular passage, uh, and I'll read it for us just uh, so our hearers will know where we're at. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, 10, the LSB, um, so let me let me get there. It says, and, and to another, the workings of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, the distinguishing of spirits, to someone else, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the translations of tongues— Sure. In some of them, it says interpretation. We have a superscript there in the LSB. Um, what, what, do, do you remember why you decided to go with translation rather than the typical interpretation word? Yes, absolutely. I understand why people would have the word interpretation there. I, yeah. I get it because I love the subject of hermeneutics and the root word of the word there is hermeneuo which mm -hmm. is where we get the idea of interpretation. And in fact, if you stop and think about it, translation and interpretation are two sides to the same coin. There is a level of, in, there is a kind of interpretation meant for reading that happens with translation. And there is a kind of interpretation that happens with interpretation, which is about theological understanding. Yeah. And so the, the word has that continuity there. However, there are rules. And this goes back to, hey, these, this is not us trying to shove theology down a specific term or whatnot. This is us abiding by rules. And when the simple rule is when that word is used with written literature, and when that word is used with foreign language, it is not about interpretation. It is about translation. Mm -hmm. Cross-reference some other passages where that is used, like in Acts and such, it is used as the term translate. However, when a word is used with uh, moving from same language to same language, obviously we're not translating, we're translating ideas, which is the idea of interpretation. And that those are the rules of how uh, terms are used, and we abide by those rules. Awesome. Okay, um, next question. Uh, this writer says, in the foreword of my LSB, it says punctuation is a relatively modern invention. How did you or your team decide on punctuation? Are there natural breaks in the original that would lead to this, or what was your way of discerning punctuation? Amen. Actually, that's a really amazing question. Yes, punctuation is a new thing. And yet the Greek and the Hebrew, the way it is structured and organized grammatically, actually sets up for natural punctuation, natural phrasings and such. And in the English, we reflect that by adding in commas and such. And I should give a shout out to my dear brother in Christ, Jared Kingsley. We often labeled him comma man because we had to make him go through the entire translation and make sure that commas were properly added, including like Oxford commas and stuff like that. So, hey, somebody's got to do it. And he was so faithful and it takes actually someone in the original languages to know, hey, this is the way it should be punctuated because of the way Greek and Hebrew reads. And so um, he did a spectacular job and, and it, it was very, very intense and, and it could be kind of hard because that, that's a hard job, but I'm thank we're all thankful for it. But yes, the grammar of the original languages helps us set up for punctuation. Well, God bless that man who will hence be forth known as the comma man. I like um, it. Okay, next question. Are there any places in the original language where it's one word, but we don't have an equivalent word in English, so you have to use a phrase or, or more, more words? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we want to make sure we account for every word, and if possible, to do it by a word. But sometimes you got to use more than one. Sometimes a verb... It's even like a perfect tense verb, have happened. You got to use two words there. Uh, sometimes uh, a word just has to have more than one. Or how about this? What happens if you 
have a word play or two words that sound very similar or, or have a mm. similar idea. The way you distinguish between the two is you add a modifier onto it. Or what happens if a word is intensified? A good example of this is in Second Timothy, Second uh, Timothy, where it says the man of God will be complete, thoroughly complete, or uh, in the LSB, uh, that every man, uh, 2 Timothy 3, that every man may be found equipped, thoroughly equipped for mm -hmm. the work of the ministry. Mm -hmm. the, the, the words are very, very similar. There's actually just a slight addition on that intensifies. So we have to add the word thoroughly onto that. And there, you could put it this way, we're not just reflecting every word, we're trying to reflect even letters. Wow. No, that's awesome. Okay. So were there any particular, particularly difficult passages for you to translate? Were there any that took you, you a little bit longer? What was the process? What, what made it more difficult? Uh, one of my favorites to share about is actually in the Psalms where it says he gives sleep to his beloved. And uh, the irony I thought was that, man, we're losing all this sleep trying to figure out like if this is the real best way to render the phrase and how to prove that. And and in the end, it was a good way to do it. But but there's a lot of grammar involved in bringing that out and demonstrating again, because we're just checking. We're just trying to say this is the right thing. And sometimes a translation doesn't change, but that doesn't mean we didn't do the work. It's just that the work led to the affirmation of what was already there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a that was a fun one to do. James 4 has a very tricky kind of um, some tricky grammar there. Even if my memory serves me, Doug Moo in his commentary says it's one of the hardest passages in the New Testament to really uh, render from a translational standpoint just because of the intricacies there. So that's that that can be hard. Things in Second Peter have some trickiness. Even in the Old Testament, you have textual critical issues, which is where uh, different manuscripts are reading different ways and how to reconcile all that. So, yeah, there there were plenty of things where there's real need for prayer, real need for teamwork. Uh, and that's the beauty of working with a team, because not one person just has all the ideas in their head and all the wisdom. And the Lord has gifted so many different people. And man, we all came together. And and different ideas helped to solve those issues. And yeah, so were there challenges? Of course there were, but that we could get through them shows this, the word of God is clear. Yeah, I think one of my favorite ones, um, and now I can't even remember the animal, it's totally gone from my head, but I oh, yeah. heard you talking about having to do all the research on whether it was a, I don't know, was it a porcupine or a skunk yeah. or a, a kid or something? Yeah. The, the hedgehog. Yeah. The hedgehog. Yeah. And you're like, is this a red kite? What is a red kite? I'm just thinking, you know, it's the diamond thing that flies in the sky. I, I, I'm, I'm looking up animals. We're, we're, we're looking up building schematics to make sure that, you know, this <laughs> pin and this knob is exactly the way it should be and how things are being described. I mean, yeah, it, it is, it is very involved. You, you never think that translators have to go through zoology and construction and even nautical ideas to make sure everything is working correctly. Yeah, but you do. And it's fun. It's good. And uh, it's a reminder of the breadth of the word of God, because the breadth of the word of God covers so many disciplines, so many reality, the whole world. It's our father's world. This is his creation. And so everything is under that umbrella and the scripture touches on that. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. I think it's fantastic to see just the level of depth, uh, to, to hear you describe the work you put into it, even just to get to a point where you're affirming what was already there. And I think I, I would say that that's something that should give us all even greater confidence in, in, in the LSB, because you, not only did you go through the hard work, but you went through the hard work and the end result in a lot of cases was that, okay, th this is the right way to say this. Absolutely. Um, and so, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the hey, last man. question I have, Oh, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, I mean, there are times when I'm reading the LSB and I just think to myself, man, like I, I pretty much from this, I can guess what is in the Greek and Hebrew and I'm right. And, and there are times if I'm, I'm like, well, I don't, do I really need to open the Greek and Hebrew on this? I mean, 
this LSP is pretty good here, you know? And then I think, <laughs> oh, no, 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 can't be a hypocrite. Got to go. Got to be disciplined. Got to go back. But uh, I would hope that our, that everyone listening should be so encouraged because their Bible translations are so good, so good. And, and they, they are so blessed to have such a, it's truly, and I don't mean this in any kind of snarky way. It's really a legacy of translation from mm. Tyndale to the mm. KJV to all the NAS and everything down to the LSB. It is representing a legacy of Bible translation fidelity over history. And, and that, and that it hasn't changed very much is illustrative of this. You can really trust your translation. They did a great job, spectacular job. Uh, well, I said I had one more question. I actually have two. I, I, I have a silly question, and then I want to end on a bit of a more serious one, and then whatever Eki wants to throw in there. So I, I, I'm hearing rumors upon rumors that the, the the season of work got so intense for you at some stage that you found yourself essentially living off of popcorn and ramen noodles. Sure, sure. Uh, well, at one point, it was so intense that, and you know, it was during COVID. Uh, we would have these meetings. They'd be four to six hours of meetings on a day, and just going through the translation. and And at one point, I just thought, "Oh, burning up! I feel like I have a fever. feel feel terrible. What, what's wrong with me? I must have contracted COVID. How is this even possible?" But you know, you just have to endure through the meeting. and And I text my wife and from my room, and I think I said. Honey, I think I have COVID. I, I must must have gotten it somehow. She's like, you don't have COVID. You like never even seen the sky for the last like, <laughs> month. You've never been outside that room. You know, like what are you talking about COVID? Like you you're just confined. Like this is a prison cell. She's like, I'll tell you what your problem is. You're dehydrated. I gave you a pitcher of water to drink like a day or two ago, and you haven't drunk anything for like wow. 48 hours. That's how intense the work got. And so. I told the story to my fellow translators. They thought it was really funny, but then they would send me emails like, dear Abner, no change is necessary. Drink water, drink water, drink water. <laughs> you know? and, and people would just text me, drink water, drink water. Are you drinking water? You know, and and it was great. But yeah, the work, the work got intense for all of us. Uh, we were working around the clock. Um, Joe Zakovich, I remember there were just sweet times where I would take a nap from, you know, 3 a.m. to 4 five he'd be working through the night and he would we would meet at like 3 a.m talk through something he'd work on it from three to five i'd wake up at five he'd go, he'd be going to bed so that he'd be going to bed from five to seven and i'd work on it and then we just continue working at 7 a.m wow and that was that was grueling times just to make just to keep the cycle going uh and and there were times where we had to actually stop because the servers servers could face corruption uh, by the amount of times that we were all working all at the same time and and such, so it was wow. it was a intense time, and the Lord saw us through it. And but it was a sweet time. I mean, those those are times you rely on God's grace, and um, and you just sit back and you think, how did we do this? And it's so clear we didn't. It, it was mm-hmm. all all the Lord's working mm-hmm. for sure, and all the glory has to go to Him. Amen. I think it's good for for e- even though it started kind of as a joke, it's good to hear the intensity, you know, that was put into it and then and, and the man hours so that people, you know, get a sense that this wasn't just a um, kind of off the cuff, like, let, let's just do a new Bible. It was mm-hmm. taken very seriously. Um, uh, so l- let me kind of end maybe with this question, um, Dr. Chow, if when we think of men like William Tyndale, mm-hmm. um and and the men who and he, even before him John Wycliffe who was translating uh, but Tyndale for the English Bible when we think of the time period in which these men lived the challenges they faced the persecution uh the the lack of resources and the work that they got that they, they did accomplish is incredible hmm. um but but for folks who maybe have not been um, they haven't been in that history as much, and they haven't thought about the circumstances they've translated. And they're kind of asking the question, well, you know, why are the translations now better than what they did, mm-hmm. right? Can, can you kind of join together or maybe help us understand why n- newer translations or newer work does not necessarily mean it? it's it's somehow been 
corrupted or it, you know help us understand why why it's better now not because we're better men than they were but simply because of resources and accessibility and things like that well, we're always building on our predecessor's shoulders and it, what that recognizes is that they did spectacular work that we couldn't have done it without them you know i don't hold a i don't hold a candle to william tyndale frankly um i remember finishing the lsb and then in God's providence, Steve Lawson did a talk on William Tyndale. And I went to it and I empathize with so much that Tyndale went through, but it also humbles you because you realize, you know, he he, fa he faced death because he translated the Bible. He, he had to come up, the English language changed because he, he translated the scripture. Mm -hmm. He came up with new words like atonement. That's a William Tyndale. Uh, that, that's we still use vocabulary from him to this very day, not only in theology, not only in Bible translation, but in vernacular English. That is how formidable that that the Lord used him in such a way. And and so far be it for me to say, oh, yeah, we've got something better than Tyndale. Rather, I think what I would hope is that we are doing what Tyndale hoped would be done for the English language. Mm -hmm. And if anything we can leave off with is this, you know, before Tyndale and English language, um, people didn't know the Bible in at all, really. They heard it in Latin and most people didn't know Latin at the time. And, and, you know, there's been exhibits and demonstrations of people hearing the Bible in their language and understanding it for the first time. I mean, and, and one of the ones that always captures me anecdotally is, is somebody hearing, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And somebody mm -hmm. saying, God actually promises to comfort people. They never knew that. Never knew that. Because they never heard it. Because they never understood it. They never knew the precious treasures of the scripture. It should remind mm -hmm. us every single time to never take for granted that we can open a Bible and read it. Never. People died to make that happen. People died to give us that Bible. People labored so hard, sacrificed so much, just so that you could read and understand the Bible. Because we often treat and take the Bible and our translation of the Bible for granted. And we are way too cavalier with it. It's a special treasure that you can read and understand your Bible. So we should do it. And all we're doing, is preserving a lot of actually LSB translations go back loving kindness, William Tyndale. Uh, mm -hmm. We're preserving that yeah. language because we're showing the Bible they used back then, the Bible they have then, the Bible they had then in the 1800s and 1700s and 1600s, and the Bible we have now. There's not that much difference. You know why? Because the Bible doesn't change. The Bible doesn't change. Language may change. Our Bible doesn't change. And we're just trying to do and walk in the footsteps of Tyndale and not trying to show we can outdo Tyndale. That's what's going on here. Amen. Well, I think that's going to wrap up our session for today. So guys, we hope that this has been helpful to you. Uh, for those of you who are listening, really uh, our hope in doing this episode would is that it would um, give you confidence in your English translation, that it would give you exposure to why the LSB is a good tool that shouldn't be shunned, but should be added to your Bible study. Uh, Dr. Chow, you've been so gracious to give us your time. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And just all of your hard work on, on this work that God in his providence put in your lap uh, that's blessed you and in turn blessed the rest of us. So thanks for joining us today. My joy, and it's been a privilege. And man, I've just had an edifying time with you guys. So thankful to the Lord for you all. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Amen. Well, guys, we hope this has been helpful. And until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.